Thank you. Uh, so our overall topic is programmable blood clotting. So the problem we're addressing, Greg highlighted really emotionally yesterday that many people die in emergency rooms due to clotting complications. So that could be internal bleeding, stroke, pulmonary embolism, um, a secondary to other types of surgery, or heart attacks. So huge numbers of people are affected by blood clotting disorders. Um, our solution that we're talking about today is a system for external control that gives us local activation and deactivation of blood clotting um, using magnetic fields. And so the idea is you could naively think of like some sort of capsule that could be opened or closed with this magnetic activation. So why blood clotting? Firstly, it's really important. Secondly, it's really complicated and it involves things across many scales from nanoscale clustering of proteins up to macroscale properties like fluid dynamics, huge numbers of proteins in a cascade. So it's very complex and it has nanoscale properties that could be relevant to what uh, we are good at doing. Current treatments are systemic administration of blood thinners, often leading to actually the most common complication is bleeding. So uh, bleeding in your brain, which is very bad. Uh, you can also get resistance to these treatments, and they're very non-specific. So we want specific treatments that are also reversible. Uh, Say, so for example, if we have this cuff here, this is, could locally apply magnetic fields, so you could uh, sort of on the fly determine the site of activation. I'm now going to pass over to Greg. So as... <coughs> As Charlie mentioned, we need a box um, to sequester um, blood clotting factor. And as you saw in that scheme, very complex scheme of blood clotting, uh, thrombin is a very uh, powerful intermediate there. And so we want to sequester that thrombin inside um, so it doesn't have access to um, fibrinogen. And upon activation with magnetic field, we want to expose it. So one related work that uh, we found, among many others, is this <coughs> cancer-fighting robot that opens in response to um, ligands overexpressed on cancer cells. But this particular construct is irreversible. We want something reversible. So we consider it many different alternatives, like DNA boxes, um, <coughs> liposomes, protein cages. And we <clears throat> realized that for tunability of the pharmacokinetic parameters <clears throat> and activation, we need probably to go with a DNA box because we can program precisely how many thrombins we're going to put, how, what lock we're going to put, and tune the strengths of all of those. <clears throat> so now our remotely activated lock is made from <clears throat> Super paramagnetic nanoparticles, so there's typically iron oxide around uh, 10 to 40 nanometer um, magnetic core. And what happens to them is that in, in magnetic field they align the mag uh, magnetic moments and you can generate nanonewton forces. So we're going to align an array of particles on two sides of the box so it can open. but <clears throat> the way we open it is by disrupting it with uh, radio frequency that basically switches magnetic moment, misaligns them, and removes this attractive force. And this is how our remote opening is happening. So another approach over um, controlling this um, um, coagulation uh, pathway is to use the existing hemodialysis. So um, in, in ER and outside, hemodialysis is probably one of the most common medical procedures out there. And if we can use or uh, modify the current machinery uh, for this, that could be a very good um, um, test case. And what we propose is um, having the tubing, uh, which can be layered with some aptamers, which can basically capture thrombin in this process. And this, um, there was uh, an idea on similar terms published before where they used a DNA origami-based um, um, breadboard where they were capturing a thrombin, which you can see on the top left. So we propose if we can modify the tubing. Um, and based on the concentration of these adhered aptamers, control how much um, coagulation is suppressed. 
Another approach we thought about is using a magnetic field to control protein assembly. So here I put two kind of ways of possibly doing it. So you can have the thrombin on magnetic beads and also a thrombin inhibitor, which when the magnetic field is applied, they can be brought together and the affinity between the thrombin and the inhibitor can be tuned through protein engineering. Another way that can possibly do it is to split the thrombin into two parts. So here on the right, it will be a split of thrombin that uh, the, the, the bottom would be the end terminal uh, first two secondary structures of the structure. And then when it's complete, when a magnetic field is applied, then the thrombin will be completed. And, and the thrombin we put here, we can engineer it to be the active format or the inactive format to compete with a native thrombin or make it a better version to either uh, make it anti-clot or actually uh, or inhibit the function. All right, so impact, of course, blood clots, they can be good, they can be bad, but you know, there, are, there are about 200,000 people die every year in this country only from um, reasons related to blood clotting, and that includes stroke, pulmonary embolism, um, and, you know, when you, you have a premature baby, they, they can die because, you know, they put them on this heart-lung machine that Sid mentioned, and there is a lot of blood clotting happens there, so we can save a lot of lives. Um, so for risks that we were thinking of, so there's quite a lot. So there's a lot that can happen when you're working with biomedical systems. So immune responses, um, overactivation, um, and we're hoping that external control can give us a handle on some of those risks, because those are risk profiles of the drugs we already have. Um, in terms of the science, uh, we hard to scale models for flow, so we have to think of, you know, for our systems, do we, uh, we have to think of turbulence and what is happening in our in vitro models and how does that affect or represent what's actually going to happen in the body to these things. We also need to think of regulatory approval and will patients accept the use of these devices in the clinic. Um, in terms of cost and timeline, you know, it's difficult to judge, but we're thinking we at least one uh, or two years or, I mean, these are ballpark numbers for an in vitro proof of concept and five years and a lot more money for some sort of animal model. And I think that's the end. Hey guys, questions, questions. comments, helpful remarks. Okay. Oh, it's going to be turned on. Uh, so, so the question is the, the uh, magnetically actuated proteins. Incredibly cool. Like, has, have people done that before, or is that like like that's that's a thing people just do normally? So I don't know the answer. I I was asking, do because the initial I was thinking, well, maybe in, in protein design, we normally do some kind of cage assembly. But for one thing that is really hard is to make it a local administration and the local control. So if you can apply some kind of external signal to control it, thermal or magnetic field, that would be really cool. So it was uh, Greg's idea. So I'm going to throw this back to you. and. <laughs> The, the only thing we found is actually a GFP split bringing two nanoparticles together, but not the, the other way around. No one actually, to our knowledge, used magnetically, magnetic clustering to, to fuse proteins to make, to make a functional protein. I have a quick question. Um, I have a mic as well. Um, it's very cool, but um, there's a reason why external fields are going to cause a stroke in the patient. Um, have you thought about how you might, because it's quite, it's quite a, you want to control prevent bright blood pressure to prevent strokes. That's one of the major reasons. But the problem is, if you're going to be blocking things and causing aggregation externally, there's not local regulation. So I think external fields might be out, but it's a really cool idea. So I'm wondering how you can do something internally. I don't know yet, but my question is, have you thought about the problem of stroking? Um, and if you can get around that, then I think you're good to go, because I think that's one of the major concerns, um, but really nice idea. I feel bad going, oh, have you thought about this stupid thing? But I think it is quite important, because I think it's a really good idea. 
and it, you maybe don't need to do it to apply it to um, humans and blood pressure. You can apply it and blood loss. You can apply it to other things, microfluidic devices, doing discoveries, actuations for all sorts of chemistry. So, very cool. Thank you. Nice words of our <laughs> I always say nice words. <laughs> So I've uh, almost a similar comment, which, which hurts me to say so. But, um, I mean, clotting is a, a catalytically activated cascade, so I buy that you can turn it on. Um, have you any thought idea how you might turn it off? Yeah, we, we thought about both. And the way to, to turn it off, Sid presented, the way you want to turn it off is in a heart lung machine and a tubing, because in dialysis machine where coagulation is a huge problem because it deposits on the tube. And the way we propose this to block thrombin from binding to fibrinogen with optimers uh, lining the tubing. Okay, but if you've got a, a patient with, a, a, as Lee suggests, a, a clot, you know, if, 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 if stroke is the problem, um, how do you tackle that? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, we showed part of the cascade is that it is hideously complicated and there's also a pathway of clot breakdown, so fibrinolysis, or I, I don't know how to say the name. So there's a whole bunch of uh, proteins that you could have different inhibitors for some part of the cascade, but also um, things that promote breakdown of clots um, that we would hope to have a modular kind of approach where we could put in, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a part of the pathway down here about destruction of the clots. And we'd hope that our approach could be adapted to that as well and ideally have a very complex system that could include both. Uh, what happens if people get accidentally exposed to magnetic fields that will trigger <laughs> the, the opening of these things? I, I could answer it. We can tune uh, radio frequency to magnetic, uh, uh, the, to the resonant frequency of this particular magnetic particles just, just enough to misalign the Neil dipole relaxation. Dot. Okay, last question. Uh, to, on the question of lining the tubing with aptamers, the aptamer design problems, as I'm sure you know, are quite difficult one. So how do you for, foresee yourself kind of proceeding into that? Well, um, there are quite some aptamer designs already out there, but then the overarching answer is Celex. Wonderful, thank you so much. And you're just the time, wonderful, thanks guys. <laughs>